Hello. Uh, uh, given the theme of the conference, um, I s decided to think about my sort of feelings about Welsh beer and cider, uh, and came up with this idea about the invisible opportunity, which which I'll explain shortly. But first, I, sh I guess I should explain why a Yorkshireman is talking about Welsh beer and cider. Um, I've been writing about beer for about 10 years. I, I do a variety of different things. I've recently branched out into writing about cider. Uh, and I do kind of enjoy writing about beer and cider a great deal. But I am married to a Welsh person. And uh, my late father-in-law played for the Pontypool front row. So I think I qualify as sort of an honorary Welsh person. And I speak about beer and do beer tastings. Uh, I've been doing that at, at Abergavenny Food Festival for about the last six or seven years now. So I'm sorry I don't have any samples with me today. People on my table are quite disappointed about that. Um, but my aim today is to make you very thirsty indeed, so that you then go and sample uh, the beers and ciders that are here, uh, some excellent producers, um, and maybe come to uh, one of my talks if you can, uh, if you can squeeze it in. Um, so why the Invisible Opportunity? I think it's a very kind of simple three-part thing here. We're all here today because people love uh, local food and drink. I think no one would disagree with that. It's a, it's a big growth opportunity. Beer and cider, both, are pretty much more localised in the UK than, than most of the products you can find. Um, and yet, most outlets selling uh, alcohol uh, tend to stick to mostly national or even international brands. That just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. So uh, I want to sort of go through that and then talk about what the, what the remedies and the opportunities might be. Uh, so firstly, people love local food and drink. Um, like every aspect of the high street, food and drink is, is homogenised. Uh, but I found a report uh, when I was researching this that says that food tourism in the UK is worth £8 billion a year, uh, which is extraordinary. This is from an American report where they were holding up the UK as a prime example of, of the potential uh, for food and drink tourism and, and food as a, as a destination uh, for tourists and saying that it's basically one of the best countries in Europe for that. I don't know if we see ourselves that way, but that's certainly how, how the Americans see us. And, and there's been a lot of news recently about how local has supplanted organic as the, as the key buzzword to go on menus. If there hasn't been already, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion today about how saying we only source local products for our menus is kind of meaningless on menus now, but everyone says it because everyone feels that uh, it is important to people. So I think that's beyond doubt. Beer and cider are more localised than pretty much any other products. Um, beer and cider are Britain's national drinks. Um, we're famous throughout the world uh, for making them. In this curious way that we have in Britain, we don't celebrate what we do very well. But if you go to any other, if you go ask beer drinkers or cider drinkers in any other country around the world, they will say, Britain, that's the place to go. That's where I really, really want to be. Um, we now have 1,100 breweries in the UK which is more than any time since the early 1930s. Uh, the number of breweries in the UK was declining until about 2002. We were down to about uh, 400 brewers, I think. And Gordon Brown, when he was chancellor, introduced this thing called progressive beer duty, where if you're brewing under a certain volume, uh, you get tax rebates, you get, you get your duty back. Now you can use that to run a very small cottage business without paying any tax, or you can reinvest in your brewery uh, and grow and, uh, and attract lots of new people, which is what a lot of our breweries have done. We've got over 4,000 different beers on sale in the UK at any one time now. This is boom time for real ale. Uh, it's boom time for locally produced products, authentic products, products that people really love. And different regions are famous for different styles. When I first started writing about beer, and you said, if I say the word bitter or real ale, what, what comes to you? And people say, well, Yorkshire because uh, we do make the best beer in the world in Yorkshire. Um, but nowadays, if you ask that same question, people are equally like to say Cornwall, or uh, uh, not Wales yet, but I'll come on to Wales, but, uh, but various other different regions of the country that are famous for particular styles. And then some regions are just generally famous for, for ale or, or cider or pubs, if you think Herefordshire and Somerset for cider, and this part of the world just for really great pubs. Um, I remember when... Uh, when my wife's dad was still alive and, and we would come down to visit for the weekend and, and you had to book days in advance to get into some of the pubs around here. And not because they were kind of high dining or anything like that, but just because they were damn good pubs uh, that serve really great food and, and really great drinks. And, uh, and Wales is no exception in this. In, in 2006, I was asked by the uh, Mail on Sunday to write a, a piece about new breweries in each uh, 
in each sort of country in the UK. And I struggled to find uh, three breweries in Wales that I could write about. And that was 2006. Uh, today there are over 50 uh, in Wales, and that's been the kind of scale of growth. And they're absolutely everywhere. And uh, and Monmouth is very well represented. It, we've got the uh, Tudor Brewery in town in, in Abergavenny. Their beers are absolutely excellent. I've been judging the uh, the Great Taste Awards for the last couple of years, and uh, their beers always rate really, really highly in those awards. Uh, Otley down in Pontypridd, they are. Uh, they came in with this kind of innovative approach to both brewing and to designing their beers and are nationally famous. Uh, and Brecon, for the last few years, Otley and Brecon basically just handed the awards at the Welsh, Great Welsh Beer and Cider Festival to each other. They each swept the board. They're making kind of world-class beers. Uh, and a few others in here are just my favourite ones. You get some very experimental ones. I've brewed some beers with Otley. We, we did a, the last beer I did with them, we did an imperial stout flavoured with ginger and Belgian chocolate matured in Penderyn whiskey barrels. That was a night to remember. I only wish I could. Um, and, then, and then you get kind of Purple Moose, who regularly win awards nationwide for making what you might call ordinary beers, traditional ales, but they're just incredibly good. It's just like, okay, you've not done anything new or different or interesting, but so, so why is it so wonderful? And it just, it just really is. So you've got incredible uh, brewing pedigree. And it goes from the traditional to the modern. Uh, last year, these guys, Tiny Rebel, opened in Newport. Now, I have to go through Newport on the train. It's not a nice place. It's not a pretty place. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the most depressing. I grew up in Barnsley, and Newport makes Barnsley look like Provence. Yeah, it's, it's so depressing to be there, and it's had the heart ripped out of it as a community. It's a terrible place. And you've got these two young guys in their 20s who decide to go into Newport, well, they're from Newport, just say, well, we can open a brewery in Newport. And they have. And they started last year, and this year it wasn't Otley or Brecon handing the awards to each other. Tiny Rebel swept the board, and they're now opening a pub in Newport. You know, all the pubs in Newport are closing down. When you're in a town where the Weatherspoons is by far the nicest pub in town, you know you're in trouble. Um, and now it's not anymore, because these guys are, are opening pubs, they're, they're creating jobs. Uh, they're, they're bringing a sense of excitement back to a place that was just on, on its knees, really. Uh, and their beers are just incredible. As you can tell from the branding, you know, they're called Tiny Rebel. Their, their logo is a, a, a child's teddy bear with its eyes poked out and blood running down its face. You know, they're, they're, they've got attitude. They're really edgy. And the, and the beers are just superb. Uh, and the, they've got this wonderful thing, because you, you've got a beer like Kutch, um, which is you know, Welsh, except it incorporates styles and, and techniques from all around the world. Um, even Brains, you know, the, uh, when, when my wife was growing up, Brains SA, I'm reliably informed, was known as Skull Attack, because uh, it was such a horrible beer. Not anymore. Brains have reacted to the growth of the craft, craft brewing movement by launching their own craft brewery inside the big brewery. So they're still churning out SA and Reverend James and things like that for the people who've been drinking them for years. Um, but now they're making some of the best beers, not just in Wales, but, but in the UK. And again, I brewed a beer with them uh, recently, which is actually on sale, which is very exciting. It's like being asked to kind of get up and jam with your favorite band on stage. It's, it's really wonderful. Wonderful. But, but they are just doing this program of craft beers which have completely reinvented their, their image as a, perhaps an old-fashioned and, and dowdy brewery and, and reignited the passion of the staff. So you've got these guys there who drive the trucks or just kind of drive forklifts or whatever. And when I was down there brewing, they were all popping their head around the door of the little microbrewery going, what, what are we doing today then? What's happening here? What are you putting in this one? So it's an incredibly exciting uh, time. And it's no ex Wales is no exception in cider either. Um, I think the thing about the Welsh brewing industry is it's very, it's very exciting. Uh, it's, uh, it's thriving. There's all these new breweries opening. But there's nothing specific to the region that's different from everywhere else in the UK. It, it's happening. It's fantastic. There's some great Welsh breweries run by great Welsh people making great beer in Wales. But there's not a Welsh identity to it as such. Whereas cider, Wales is one of the three most important cider-making regions in the UK. Um, 20 years ago, it wasn't. No one was making cider in Wales. The, the, the explosion in Welsh cider-making has been truly astonishing. Um, and cider is about terroir. You know, Herefordshire uh, is one of the best cider-making regions on the planet because of its combination of soil and climate and, and weather. 
And that terroir bleeds over the border into Monmouthshire, and Monmouthshire is perfect cider-making country. Uh, you can't take that away, you can't deny it. Uh, we have some kind of arguments and tetchiness about using the word terroir, but, but if a combination of climate and soil and minerality and weather uh, creates unique conditions for one particular fruit, which is used to make alcoholic drinks, why would it not apply to any other alcohol, fruit that's used to make alcoholic drinks? And Monmouthshire terroir is, is really special. Uh, and there are, there are specific varieties of apple that grow well here. And, and the cider makers, all of them kind of have a similar story. They're either farmers who had a few trees on their land. Uh, a lot of farmers used to kind of grow apples uh, to make uh, cider, which was part of the wages of itinerant farm workers. And then when Bulmers over the border started to get really big, they found that they could sell their apples to Bulmers uh, and buy Bulmers cider back from them, and it was cheaper than making, than making their own. And so it kind of declined. And then cider became boring, and some of these apple trees have been kind of rediscovered, and people started to make it as a hobby. Uh, and what starts as a hobby for a lot of people is becoming, uh, becoming a profession. And these are two. Uh, the guy on the left is Andy Hallett, uh, about five miles away, just down the road, um, on top of a mountain outside, uh, outside Pontypool, uh, just making amazing cider and kind of giving up the rest of the farming um, business to concentrate on his cider. And his ciders are here. Uh, this weekend, and the guy on the right, Rose's Triple D cider up in uh, up in North Wales, just um, got at a confluence of two big main roads at the bottom of a mountain, and he's just opened this cider shop. And I was there for about an hour, and just people pouring in off the off the road, just kind of going, "Oh, we saw this big sign at the junction, uh, coming to taste some cider and and buy some cider." Cider pubs are just phenomenal. Uh, the the pub on the left is the Clyther Arms, again five minutes drive. Uh, out of Abergavenny, possibly the best cider pub, certainly the best cider pub in South Wales. Just absolutely wonderful. And the food there is utterly outstanding as well and really pairs well with the cider. Uh, the one on the right is uh, the Nantiffin Cider Mill, just out towards, um, out, out towards uh, Krakowell, uh, going in the other direction. Uh, built around what, what was a working cider mill until the 1960s. Uh, and now just uh, an absolutely wonderful place. Again, top-notch food and cider really at the heart of what they do. And then uh, Raglan Cider Mill. Uh, this is Boris. He's not really called Boris, but he looks a bit like Boris Johnson, so everyone calls him Boris. Uh, and he's got this barn on his land, um, started making cider. This is his cider upstairs from there. Um, the pipes feed straight up to a cider barn, which is open on a Friday night and a Sunday afternoon. You, you, you you need to kind of phone up in advance to make sure that they're open. And he serves cider in this kind of traditional old cider, cider pub style thing, which is going at the camera wreck. There are less than a dozen of these places left in the UK, and he's just opened one. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the first time I was in there, there's old locals in there, and uh, they said, I remember, the, I remember the tree that piece of wood came from. Oh, yeah, that's the, tree, that's the crucifixion tree, isn't it? And they saw me staring, and they said, oh, we just do things differently around here. And it's... <laughs> Okay. But it makes wonderful cider, and it's a great place to go. And then the cider festivals. Has anyone ever been to the Gower Cider and Cheese Festival? You've got to go. You, you just have to go. It's the most... It's like, it's like a piss-up in Hobbiton. Uh, it, it's, it's the most extraordinary thing. Me, me and Bill, my, my co-author on our cider books, arrived at 11 a.m. just as it opened. We had a look around the place, because it's quite small, and said, oh, there's not much here. We'll just, we'll just have a quick drink, and then... Maybe have a big, bit of a drive around the Gower Peninsula now we're down here. Twelve hours later, we were singing along to sea shanties, uh, <laughs> waving cider around. It's just the most extraordinary event. Uh, and cider and cheese go together like ant and deck. You know, you, you, and at their best, you can't tell which one's which, and, uh, and they're just really wonderful. Uh, and just down the road again from here, you've got the, uh, the, Welsh, the Great Welsh Cider and Perry Festival, which is a, a wonderful event. So it, there's a really thriving cider culture here. But most cafes, pubs, and restaurants stock mostly or entirely national or international brands. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, Stone Mill Restaurant in uh, Rockfield. And I heartily recommend it as a restaurant. The food there is wonderful. Uh, on their website, they make a big point about how they source all their food locally. They list their suppliers. They talk about how the bread is made on the premises. Uh, the meal we had was utterly fantastic, and they stock Magnus. And it's just, what, why? 
Um, I think for a lot of people, beer and cider are exceptions to the, to the standards of excellence we put across everything else. Um, a, a brewer called Brewdog a few years ago phoned around 10 different Michelin starred restaurants in the UK and said, I've got a mate, he's a bit weird. Uh, he only drinks beer, so I want to make a booking, but before we do, could you tell us what beers you have? And without fail, these michelin star restaurants say, yeah, we've got Stella, Bex, and Guinness. Now, if they, ha if they were that lazy about any other aspect of their business, they'd be stripped of a Michelin star. You know, restaurants that have five different types of salt and ten different types of bread think it's acceptable to sell the blandest, most mass-produced mainstream beer and cider. It's just not good enough. And also it's stupid because it's a massive loss of, of revenue or potential revenue. And I'm sorry to single out Rockfield if anyone knows it, but um, Bill and I were, uh, spent last year researching this book, the, the Welsh Guide to Cider and Perry, uh, on behalf of the Welsh uh, Perry and Cider Society. And we've got every significant uh, Welsh cider maker in there, but then there's also chapters on Welsh cider pubs. And when we got given the list of Welsh cider pubs to go around, we kind of found this everywhere we went. A good cider pub would stock the one Welsh cider that is brewed or made most locally to them, and then maybe Westerns and Gwinty Drag and Magnus and, and Bulmers. It's, it's just kind of a very strange situation. And it does apply to beer as well. You know, you, you, I think beer's in a much, much better situation than cider is. But still, when you go in most pubs, you see the same brands you would see anywhere else around the country. So what is the problem? Why is this? Is it that the products aren't any good? Is it that a cider made in a, in a Welsh mountainside isn't as good as Bulmer's or Magnus? No. <laughs> They're far, far, far better. Uh, when Welsh cider makers first set up in the, in the early noughties, they won UK competitions from the get-go instantly. Same with beer. Uh, Otley, um, Purple Moose, all those guys, they're renowned around the UK. They're very, very good products. Is it a price premium? Well, this is a product, this is a problem for some people. Um, again, I'll use cider as an example, but if you want to really, what is cider made out of? Anybody? Apples? Yeah, cider's made out of apples. Um, so if you've got a product and they don't have to list their ingredients, but if they did, if, if, there's, if they said, this product contains 35% apple juice, water, apple concentrate from, oh, that apple juice is apple juice concentrate shipped from China and reconstituted, chemical sweeteners, caramel to make it look nicer. It's not cider. Imagine if you bought a bottle of wine and it said this contains 35% grape juice from concentrate, sugar, water, uh, uh, additives and preservatives. People would think that was disgusting. Well, if you make your cider like that, you can sell it really cheaply, which is what Magnus and, and Bulmers do. If you're gonna make a 100% juice product on a small artisanal scale, it's gonna be more expensive. But guess what? It's worth the expense and people are prepared to pay more for it. Supply chain issues, well, this might be a problem for some people. It's like, well, I just don't know where to get it. Um, this can be an issue and some of these things aren't always available uh, as much as they should be. But finding them is half the fun. And I promise you, if, if anyone is in, in retail, if you build relationships with local brewers, or local cider makers, they're very good relationships to build. You have, tend to have a good time when you're talking to them. You tend to get kind of tastings that get carried away and, and things like that. Is there a sense, I think this might be significant, is there a sense that the public would rather see established familiar brands in beer and cider? Now, I got into beer writing originally through um, working in beer advertising. I made adverts for Stella Artois and Heineken. Uh, that was in the late 90s, and at that point, there was definitely a sense that if you walked into a pub, people needed to see familiar brands that they'd seen advertised on the telly. If it wasn't a tele-advertised brand with a funny ad, then it kind of wasn't worth bothering with. That is no longer true. Um, mainstream beers and ciders have become totally commoditized. They get bought in the off-trade on price deal. Uh, people have a, a sort of an acceptable repertoire of brands. And incredibly, it's still the housewife who does most of the shopping. She knows that the husband will accept Foster, Stella, Guinness, Carlsberg, whatever, so she just buys whichever one is on the cheapest deal. When people go to pubs, they're bored sick of those beers. Those beers offer them nothing in terms of, of, of brand affinity or in terms of flavor or taste. They've been blanded out beyond all recognition. And people now are actively seeking out uh, the new, the different, the original. And one great example of this is the growth of uh, small-scale lager breweries in, in the UK. Uh, with new lager brands coming out um, and replacing the, the old ones. 
Um, so more on that, Cascale massively outperforms the rest of the beer market. The beer market is in long-term decline. Uh, this is from the Cask Report, which you've got sneak preview here. I, this is an annual real ale market report that I do uh, every September. And, and the darker line is, is the total beer market, which last year fell by 7.8%. Uh, real ale fell by 1.1%. Hardly surprising given the amount of pubs that are closing in the UK. Um, but real ale is now consistently outperforming the rest of the beer market. There's still, perhaps in some quarters, this kind of vestigial notion that real ale is something that old men drink. No, they don't. Um, most people who serve real ale say that uh, it is bringing in more young people and uh, more women to their pub. Real ale is kind of stretching out from its traditional audience, and it's now a drink for absolutely everybody. And there's this, this stereotypical old image of a, an old man in a flat cap nursing a warm pint of real ale. That guy is now probably drinking Carlsberg or Carling, uh, because that's what was popular when he was in his 20s. And people are going for small producers. In the real ale market, the top 10 brands account, now account for less than 30% of total volume. So people are actively seeking out small brands, brands that they're not familiar with. And, and when you ask them what they're looking for, 70% of them say, I want something that's brewed locally. Interestingly, 70% also say, I want something from a different part of the country. So people want to support their local breweries in the places where they live, but they don't want to drink that exclusively. They also, now, every now and again, want to try something from somewhere else. So you win both ways. Your local population wants to try something brewed near them, and visitors want to try something that they've not had before when they come here. So finally, is it, is it lack of knowledge among retailers? Is it just that people who are busy running a, a, a business don't have time to go and track down all these quirky, interesting products that people want to buy and pay more for? Well, I think that probably is an issue, uh, and hopefully this presentation sort of helps give anybody who's interested a, a bit more sort of uh, um, motivation to go and find out a bit more. But, but the information is there if you want it. Um, insider. There's the Welsh Perry Insider Guide. Um, we produced this for the, for the Welsh Perry Insider Society, who are desperate to help anyone uh, increase the awareness and sales of uh, those 40-odd Welsh cider makers that now exist. And in beer, uh, CIBA, the, the Society of Independent Brewers, uh, does huge things to help people stock local beer. They have this nationwide system called DDS, uh, and you can just say, look, I don't know who my local breweries are, but I want to stock four beers that are brewed within 30 miles of this pub. And they will sort it out for you and, and make, it, make it really easy. Camera have got a branch in every single town and city. They're desperate to help people learn more about great beer uh, and stock more of it. So in summary, people are actively looking for lo local food and drink products across the board. I don't see why beer or cider should be any exception to that. They're prepared to pay more for it when they find it, but they're not getting it in beer and cider as much as they should be. And Wales is one of the most exciting regions in Britain for local beer and cider. Some of the best producers in the UK are right here. And Welsh brewers and cider makers offer things nobody else can offer. It's like a treasure hunt. It keeps you separate uh, from the kind of bland homogeneity of the rest of the market. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sweet.